the slides, hit that if you want to download the PDF of the slides. I tend to zip through these fairly quickly. So if I am speaking too quickly, oh my God, raise your hand, let me know, okay? Because uh, I want you to get this information. In writing this talk, I had this fantastic, oh my God, it was an amazing introduction and I did the, I practiced it and then I realized, oh my God, I have too much new information to cover. So that's the entire end of the introduction. Uh, <laughs> let's see if we can get this going. No, I have no idea what just happened. Keynote just quit. Sweet. We're going to ignore, we're going to cancel, we're going to open. Recent. We're going to giggle and laugh, be a little embarrassed, scroll to the top, and we're going to hit play. Hey, okay. I am here simply to help you look good. You're here to learn about website performance increasing your site performance as well as automating, maintaining that performance once you get it. We're gonna do this with Grunt with a big heads up, oh wow, my slides are showing up there, with a big heads up that a lot of the tools that I talk about apply to other ways of automation. You can do this with Grunt, you can do this with Gulp, you can do this with Broccoli, you can do this with Bash scripts. You have lots and lots of opportunities. You're not required Grunt. I happen to like Grunt. So. The fundamental tenant of website performance is that it is everybody's problem. And the problem with making it everyone's problem is that a lot of times we do things and we don't know how it impacts the site. One of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that when we make changes, we know how it affects things. We need to know, did we, if we make a change to improve performance, did it succeed, did it not, uh, or, or we're not even sure. So. I'm gonna try and lose the Canadian accents. The process here is pretty much these four steps. We're gonna determine the key metrics that we care about. We are going to establish a baseline. Where are we now? We're going to make a change, and we're going to measure that effect of the change. Oops, one more click. Uh, then we're gonna make a change, repeat the change, make a change, uh, and then measure. And we're just gonna repeat this over and over again. So, to start, first step. What do we want to measure? If we don't know what we're measuring, we can't say, that, oh, it's faster, oh, you know, it seems faster. It's like, well, what does that really mean? A lot of people have already defined the key metrics and what we want to be testing. Here's one that you have probably heard. 40% of users will abandon a site if it doesn't load in three seconds or less, or fewer, fewer. Uh, you kind of have to take this with a grain of salt because if you look at the statistics, it's actually not quite true. People, people will wait for your website. If this is true for an e-commerce website. And in that particular case, you definitely want to, you know, you want to get them there and you want to get them buying really fast. But for everyone else, if you're doing a content site or if you're doing something else, it, it's okay to have a little bit of leeway. In reality, these studies are also what people say they do. If you look at the statistics, what they really do is there are people that once they have been there for 20 seconds, they are invested and they are waiting for that thing to load. So <laughs> people will stay on your website. One way of defining the goals is with a performance budget. This is a concept popular, uh, created and popularized by Tim Kedlick. And basically it's the upper bound on your metrics, on your key metrics. Your key metrics could be load time, it could be page size, it could be the number of requests, it could be at what point is the site actually usable by a end user? And that's the one that I think is the most important. Tim has written a number of articles on the subject. They are worth reading. This one, the middle one in particular, is about what to measure and strive for initially on a project. And again, don't copy down those URLs, just grab the slides. They're all in there, clickable. They should be clickable. If they're not, I will make them clickable. If you don't know where to start, you know, I'm, gonna do a, I'm gonna do a performance budget. Where do I start? Here's an aggressive one. Let's just pull for what someone else has already done. Etsy has these incredible performance budget goals. It is just like, it, it stuns me. It's like, I can't do that with my site, my personal site, but they have a lot more resources. And you wanna do, you, you have different key metrics that you're doing. So they have the load time, they have page weight for the mobile, and they have the page weight for the browser, fast network, slow network, that sort of thing. 
if you have no, if you don't know where to start, these are a great place to start. I would honestly triple, quadruple them uh, in my projects to start, and then work to get them down. So, with this, and we've read these things, we now have our key metrics. So, we're going to establish a baseline. Where are we now? We want to know how fast our website is. So, quick show of hands, how many people know how fast their website is? Yeah, that's, uh, yes, but that's not really acceptable. I mean, you can imagine a lot of, there are a lot of cases where uh, yeah, it's fast enough, it's fast enough, and uh, the CEO of the company is on an edge network somewhere out in the boonies and tries to load up the page, and it takes him two minutes to load up the page, and like, it comes back and it's like, okay, we're making the site performance, and you like spend a lot of time working on this, and then it's great, and then, things kind of happen again sort of thing. So we really want to know how fast our, our sites are. We want to know that they're going to continue to, to get fast and they're going to get fast and stay fast. The easiest way to do this, the very simplest way to do it, is just open up your browser and look. You open up the developers tabs, you open up the network tab, you reload a page, and you see this waterfall. This waterfall says how long something takes to render, what things are being blocked, what things will not start loading until the next thing starts loading. Firefox has this, Safari has this, IE has this, IE's next generation has this, uh, Chrome has this. And if you, if you go and look on the Chrome one, the Chrome has this fantastic, this link explanation tells you what's going on and the documentation is amazing. This, this, this page that they have, the link is at the top, is, the page to just start with to understand key metrics. Just start with the browser, it is fantastic. And so, when you look at this waterfall, this waterfall will tell you uh, different stages of how page assets get to you. And it's worth noting that not all of these are front end issues. One of the things that if you look on my website, I, I do SSL on everything, but it takes a second and a half sometimes for the browser to go to my site to come back to say, nope, go to this other one. That, that's, if my performance budget has me at three seconds, I've lost a second and a half to this redirect sort of thing. So this is not necessarily a good thing. Another one is uh, SSL negotiation. The, the handshake happens to take a long time on my server. I don't necessarily want Apache SNI anymore. I want a dedicated IP address. So these are things that are back end that affect the front end and you have to be aware of those. So it's not just the front end peeps. The easiest way, after you've looked at the browser, the waterfall, and you just want to look at key metrics, browser metrics, you're not sure what they are, and you want to, you want to do it, is to load up this perf bar. It is a bit of JavaScript. Again, slides, cut and paste, don't copy that. Um, and what it'll do is at the bottom of every page that this isn't loaded on, it'll show a little toolbar at the bottom, you click on it, and it'll show you when you load this page key metrics that are interesting, things like how long it took on the back end and how long it took on the front end. This is, this is the, these two, just looking at your browser, and then this one are the easiest ways to just get a feel for where you are. This one is great if you're doing development work and you wanna know your performance on this change that I just did compared to the one that I had just done 10 minutes ago or an hour ago. This one is great. However, I know what you're all thinking. I'm not gonna click on all of this, and this deals with my network. I am sitting here, and I am on this latest generation MacBook, and I have all of this memory, and no tabs open, because normally I have 600 tabs open, and you know, oh man, this, this speed looks fantastic, I'm done, I am done. This is a valid scenario, because when you do your performance budget, you're gonna have the desktop, you're gonna have the people who are sitting in a, a high speed, and they're gonna have the fastest things, and, and, and that's okay, it's, it's a valid test case. But it doesn't handle automation, which is really kind of what we wanna do. We wanna make sure that these things are in everybody's face. So, we're gonna do that with Grunt. As mentioned, with Grunt. I'm going to assume that no one here has used Grunt, and at the end of this, all of you can use Grunt. So, if you've used it before, bear with me, and if you haven't, welcome. Grunt is a JavaScript task runner. You configure it and you basically have it do all of these repetitive tasks. It uses Node server side and it uses NPM, the Node package manager, to configure and get all of the different dependencies in. 
to install Node, you pretty much download it. It's a little bit more difficult with Linux, and if you're using Linux, you want, likely want to use a few more tools, come and talk to me. Uh, there's lots of information online also. But if you're using your desktop in order to set things up, you, you pretty much, you just download, double click. You get NPM, Node Package Manager, and this is how we're going to install everything like Grunt. So after installing Node on the command line, Grunt is installed with npm install-g grunt-cli. So there are two parts to Grunt. There is the one that runs globally, and that triggers the one that runs locally in every project. This way, you can have different versions in the project and have the one, the globally one, just triggers all of those. This means that when you have a project and have it set up perfectly, and oh my god, and then you mothball it, and then client comes back, Four months later, you can come back, and you can then bring it back, and you know that it's gonna keep working, even if you have upgraded everything else. The, the, the versions are gonna work, which is fantastic. Grunt needs two files to work. There's the package.json and the grunt.js. Uh, there's a number of ways to create these files. For example, to create a package.json, you can do npm init on the command line, and that will give you a bunch of instructions that pretty much no one reads and a bunch of questions to answer. So you answer these questions, and you end up with uh, a JSON file that looks like this, JavaScript, you know what this looks like. Uh, uh, I kind of say, eh, fooey to all of that, just download what someone else has already done. Uh, it makes it a lot easier, it makes it quicker, and I've already done one for you. So there's one, this, the second link is the one that you download it, and once you download it and you have these things, you're gonna have something similar to this, and this is more what a package.json for a grunt project looks like. In particular, it has your, your node engine, and it has your dev dependencies. Uh, these dependencies have versions on them. The tilde before the version means match the minor number. If you have a caret, it means match the major number, so if you can, can be a little bit flexible with your compatibility. What happens when you have this package.json in there is that you can then do npm install, and that will go off to the node package registry, and it will download those, pack, those packages locally, and so, Dash G means that it doesn't go globally. It's not gonna be available in all the projects. It's just gonna be available in the local project and it's going to create a node modules directory. And this is, if you look in the, if you do an Alice in the, the node modules, you're not gonna list all of these uh, libraries that you just downloaded. Now, as a general rule, you wouldn't commit your node modules directory to your repository. Um, when you want to run tasks and you want to automate all of these and you're running tests, for example, and you wanna redo your environment, you're gonna to have to balance between, I'm using up disk space for these node modules and uh, I'm using bandwidth in order to download all these again and again and again. So you can set up your own private uh, repository or you can check these in, that's kinda of dependent on you. There are a couple of resources. Um, I have no opinion because I don't know your projects. Um, so a grunt.js file looks something like this. The file is just JavaScript and then in .js, any valid JavaScript is works in here. One of the things that um, a lot of people will do is they will do all of their grunt files located in the same as their project files. And um, I know a couple of Rails developers that are very upset that there's this node stuff cluttering up the Rails project. And you don't have to do that that way. You can definitely set it up so that it's it's in parallel and references this. So it's, it's, it's JavaScript. It's nothing that you, you haven't seen before. The important parts that you'll need is uh, to include the package.json file. Um, we, want, we don't want to have to declare our dependencies a couple of times, so we just include this one. We then have our plugins. These are the tasks that we're going to call on the command line with commands. So you take tasks and these are the ones that we say, okay, run this task with these options on these targets. Next, we're going to include our library files that we downloaded and we installed with the npn install. And then we're going to do commands. Commands are what you will run on the command line, grunt space this command, and the command is built up of the tasks that we have defined above and included with our libraries. All makes sense, right? Yeah, I, I saw some smiles. One of the things that we really don't wanna do, because quite honestly, I am one of the laziest people you will meet. Lazy, efficient. I'm one of the most efficient people you'll ever meet, is have this in my file, in my uh, grunt.js. I don't wanna have to, oh, I just installed this thing, why isn't it working? Oh, because I forgot to include it. Not gonna happen. So we're going to include match depth. You'll see here that 
the dash dash, I don't know if you can see that that's red, a dash dev. What that does is that says, take this module that I am now downloading and include it in my package.json so then I can check that into my source code and I know that this is now going to be available. You don't have to do the dash dash save dev. Uh, if you don't, then you get it locally and when someone else runs it, it's gonna fail. So it's an easy way to save it. And then when we do this, now we can just have this globbing. We can just glob it, just a single line that includes all of our, our tasks. Woohoo! We are on our way. Zoom. All right, first thing we're gonna do, now we're gonna start this automation part is with Grunt, is we're gonna look at DevPerf. DevPerf is a Grunt module that uses Phantom AS in the back end, which is Phantom JS with metrics. So Phantom JS is a headless browser. It basically lets you download and render pages without sitting there on the browser door. You can programmatically download these things. And when you, as mentioned, tasks have options and then they have targets. So dev for basic options, we can go ahead and like look at this one. And if you look at this, localhost 8000, this is not going to give us any interesting data. Woohoo, everything is really fast, as expected. So a more realistic one looks more like this. So we have our URLs. This is what we're going. To, this is what we're testing. We're going to do the performance on this. We want to um, the the open number of runs. Uh, one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to do your performance with data points of one. A data point of one is the data point of none, according to my professor in college, because you don't. You don't have enough information. Do you have a straight line? Do you sit down? You have no idea. So you want to run multiple runs, and you go ahead and take the median of that and say, this is our performance. So number of runs, five. You do a couple more things. Uh, we output the, the results to a folder, and what we get, it, once we run it, uh, remember back in the command, I said the command is PE, so this is the output of the run, and man, I really should have made that a bigger font, but then I'd have to scroll. So you end up with a page that looks like this, and when you have one data point, one data point is kind of worthless. So run it multiple times, and what we end up seeing is how we're doing. Again, over time, we see that these things are, are changing, and we're getting better, we're getting worse, and we know these things. Um, a more interesting one than this one, where everything is green, yeah, green good, is this one, which has a whole bunch of reds. And this, this particular module is fantastic because it tells you, you need to do this at the very bottom. It just says, here's what you need to fix. And it gives you pretty graphs along with it, but here's what you need to fix. So I think at this point, we're like on the right track to starting to improve our performance. So looking at this, and we're seeing what these are, we, just, we can just start with, the, start with the fix this things at the bottom. And the first thing it says on one of mine is remove the HTML comments. Comments are fantastic when you're doing development and, and you, you know that this ends there and this, this goes with this and this other stuff and it, it, you don't need necessarily that in production unless you're debugging something that you really want in production, but normally you don't need it in production, so you can remove them. And you can do this in your template files with the grunt, grunt contrib HTML min, which will get rid of comments, it will also squish them a little bit, take away some of the space, Spaces that you have, any grunt module that starts with contrib means that it is maintained by the grunt maintainers. So when you're looking for ones to use, uh, which you do on npm.js, uh, the website, uh, when you're looking for them and you're like, oh, I searched for this and there's like 16 different ways to do SAS and grunt, and this is okay because people are just scratching different itches. If you have one that has contrib, use that one because you know it's going to be around for a while. So we set it up where we have our task, which is the HTML min. We have our target distribution, in this particular case, production. And then we have development. We have different things that we want to do for development. Maybe for development, we just want to remove spaces. Maybe we don't want to remove spaces. And so you can set up the different targets, and then we can run them. When we run these things, we want to make a change and then we want to measure any effects. And this is important because if you make too many changes, you don't necessarily know what causes problems or what, what you did to improve things that you should keep doing. So any changes should be checked as, as soon as possible. And it doesn't need to be checked necessarily on production. You don't necessarily have to push all your production. Having a testing environment where you push to the testing environment and then see the difference just between this and the last run is very helpful in when improving in performance. Concatenating and minifying CSS. This one's a big one that pretty much, uh, I haven't been on a project that hasn't done this recently. This one, this one and setting all of your assets to send via gzip are pretty, pretty standard now. 
If you don't, if you don't have, are, are using a system that does, got you covered. Grunt, contrib, CSS, min, will, you can configure this. Um, oh, I don't have a config file there, my apologies. Uh, you can configure it and it will uh, aggregate the CSS files and then strip out the spaces. Uh, you can remove duplicate CSS. Uh, if you have a case where um, you're working um, with preprocessors and you have everything nice and modular and you're fantastic with all of these things, it turns out that you can have something in one file and something in the same file. In reality, just the selectors, if you put them both in the same file, now you've removed all of this extra stuff. So removing duplicate CSS is a way that you can do this with CSS, CSS. If you're getting really aggressive, you can remove unused CSS. Yes, you can automate this, and quite honestly, this one terrifies me. Oh my God, automatically removing CSS when it, yeah, it's used like this one time in this one place and you have to have it sort of thing, and it's just absolutely, oh gosh, this one terrifies me. So, if you are going to automate removing CSS, I highly recommend automating visual re regression tests. So, uh, Phantom CSS, is also built on Phantom JS, but what it does is it takes screenshots and then does a visual comparison so that you know what changed. And this is fantastic just during development because there have been times when in a preprocessor I'm going along and oh, I'll just change the link to red and then suddenly everything in the entire site is red. Oops, I didn't mean that, I only meant this one. So having the visual differences uh, and you can just scan and look at it is fantastic. So if you are going to automatically remove CSS, I highly recommend something like this and you can set it up fairly, fairly straightforward uh, one of the things that it specifically does is it has these tests, and what these tests are, they are Jasper files that you can use to walk where your site is, uh, where in the site you want. So if you need to log in or something, you, you control your site, you can submit posts and follow along, so you can get to exactly the right page in the exact same state that you, you need it in. One of the other things that I really like about uh, Phantom CSS is that you can pick parts of the page. I am just gonna be removing stuff in this particular template or this particular file, and so I can do regression testing on just the header or just the sidebar, and, or just these pages, and I, I, I like that a lot. Instead of automatically removing things, we have CSS stats. Um, you can, it's, it's a website, and we have a grunt test that, that matches it, and this website is fabulous. If you haven't used it before, uh, I ran it on my, on my site and was like, <gasps> Oh my goodness, I have 62 background colors of which I use three. And I was like, whoops. Uh, pretty sure I'm using a framework when I have, how many is this? 30 some font sizes, I use two. Um, and I have 10 different fonts, I use three. And so it's kind of like, it's, it's an eye opener to see these kind of things. And again, we can automate this so that we can keep track of these over time. Maybe put up a big Dashify board up that says these are the things that are changing in red. And, uh. One of the things that I really like about automating this particular one is that it also checks for invalid CSS. So this looks great on this browser, but it happens to render a particular C invalid CSS one way and I get to another browser and it renders it in a different way. And this will catch, uh, you can have it barf on invalid CSS, which I, I find helpful on a number of times. This is the URL. All right, aggregate and minify JavaScript. Very similar to the CSS, a lot of people are doing this. Um, Uglify is the one that most people use to do this. Uh, pretty straightforward. Again, when you make a change, you wanna measure the effects every time. All right. Too many small images. Uh, these are images that, uh, we're, still, we're still on the first tool, right? We're still like, these are all the things that it told me was wrong with my website. Too many small images. You have like the icons in various different places, but it's like, okay, we already have a sprite for that, you're thinking. But also, you have, let's say you have a design that has this sidebar and it has small thumbnails, right? It's got like six, six thumbnails that rotate uh, out out of 12 or 24. Putting those images also into a sprite is very helpful because now you have one request, you don't have these six requests that rotate every time someone reloads the page. It's fabulous. So you can stick them. Uh, grunt montage is uh, one of the several, this is one of the cases where there are many different ways to make sprites in Grunt that you can use. Uh, I happen to like it, mostly because I use it, it has all the features that I, I have, recommended. But, and the example here has icons, but again, you can do it for thumbnails. 
Imageman. Uh, Imageman, so every image has cruft in it. Uh, GIFs have like lots of cruft, uh, PNGs, JPEG, every, everyone has, ex file has extra header information. So what Imageman does is it essentially reduces the file size without reducing the file quality, or the image quality, which is great because why send over bits that you're never gonna be used? And it is also straightforward. You can usually run this just once. You're not gonna get optimization, so once the files are run once. Uh, you're good. Uh, SVG, we're all moving towards SVG. It makes it even easier, but even they have cruft in them because they, like editors, have a lot of pointers and information in them, put a lot of information into the SVG. So this is a way for you to get rid of even that. If you, all right, yeah. I think I was supposed to ask a leading question right here, which is pretty much, what's the biggest thing that happens on every web page? And if you don't know what this is, oh, come on. What's the biggest? It's right there in purple. Yeah, <laughs> images. Okay, so images are the biggest thing and we can resize images. Um, responsive images are completely and totally the way to go and you wanna make sure that you, when you resize them, you actually send the smaller images also. Um, there's a new, um, HTML5 has uh, the, the new uh, image that has the sizes in the attributes. Highly recommend and look that up and use that. But we can resize the images and these values we can specify so that we have our mobile size, we have our medium size, our tablet size, we have our large size, we have our retina size, we can automatically generate this. So as an easy way to just go through, if you don't have something that is automatically resizing them, go ahead and resize them. Uh, if you are looking for a magical SVG to PNG fallbacks, uh, there is uh, Gruntcon. It's just, it is declared the unicorn of SVG files. All right. Whew. All right. What else is really big on pages, since I forgot to ask the first one? After images, what's the next biggest one? Anyone? Yeah, web fonts. This happened to me. No, two megs of web fonts is not acceptable. My answer was indeed no. Um, but we did compromise, and the compromise that we made is that uh, I was going to subset. Uh, we, the particular project was an English only website, and so we were able to just take out all of the non-English characters. We were able to subset. Basically, we have this giant font file, and we are only ever gonna use these characters, and so we were able to reduce it down to kilobytes instead of megabytes. It was still hundreds of kilobytes, but we took that hit. So, subsetting web fonts, um, yeah. So, you're thinking, all right, great. I'm still sitting in my office and I'm still, or, or the coffee shop, and I'm going through and this is all still dependent on my network. Yeah. So let's change it so that this process is not. And to do that, webpagetest.org is your best friend. Oh my gosh, your best friend. It is the gold metric in web performance. This is the one that all the major sites go to. Uh, it's been around since AOL open sourced it in 2008. It's well sponsored. <laughs> Fabulous, I absolutely love it. It allows you to specify the test location uh, with installs and servers all around the world, and it lets you shape the traffic. So you can say, I am on a 3G, slow 3G network in England, and I'm gonna access my site in California. And so it gives us the opportunity to get these metrics that you wouldn't necessarily have. We're gonna automate this. So the first step in automating it is to request an API key, link at the top. Uh, the, Downside of this particular API key is that it is limited 200 page views per day. A uh, few per day, I was thinking it might be worse. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, if you're running multiple tests, you're doing five tests and taking the medium, now suddenly uh, you're down significantly fewer if you're doing 10 pages, you know, it's just like these add up, especially if you're gonna want to integrate this into any kind of CI. So if you need more, you can set up your own web page test server. So once we have it set up, once we have our key, or we have our server, and, we, and therefore we have our key, uh, grunt perf budget. Uh, it's a grunt task for enforcing performance budgets in builds, and you do it on the command line uh, while you're testing, but also in builds. Uh, we set up what our metrics are, and we can track, and we can fail the builds that don't, aren't performant. The changes that you make aren't performant. So 
the one that you see on the website is this one where you know, here's the URL and I put my key here and I run it. In reality, this is more likely to what yours is going to be. Uh, this is what mine is for one of my projects where um, I have my particular instance and I specify a different URL than web page test. And uh, you might need to adjust, it's certainly when you start off a few more variables. When I have a 3G connection, everything times out. The first time, absolutely everything times out. So I usually bump everything up to, oh God, if my thing doesn't render in four minutes, I think I will kill myself. But so we go ahead and run this. Um, again, if you go back a couple, let me go back a couple real quick. You'll see my register task budge uh, at the bottom, which means that I do a grunt budge at the top, and unsurprisingly, it fails the first time. That's okay. I'm trying to establish what my baseline is in this particular case, and perhaps my performance budget was too aggressive. So we can configure this so that, okay, here's where I currently am, and don't fail the build for it's over this, because we know that we're not doing well yet, but eventually we start to bring these, these performance, these key metrics down. So then with these new ones that are, are less aggressive, we now have, okay, woohoo, we're winning. With this, web page test also has a film strip view which shows you as your site is being loaded, little screenshots, and you can see at what point, oh, it took 30 seconds for my user to see anything, or oh, you know what, this grade loads, maybe I should have this, this my default color to be white so they can see it on this gray, and then when the background image comes on, flip it over to a different color. It enables you to see when something first starts up. This is especially important when you are doing the performance step of on, your, on the main page that people access, you're just gonna inline CSS. Uh, if you inline your first 25, I think 25K or 200K of CSS, that gets downloaded with the page and it will render immediately before the rest of the files have downloaded. You also get the waterfall. And the waterfall has lines in there that says, here's when things started happening and it labels the key metrics for you. All right, now, great, we've got this. Now what do we do? We can integrate these into CI builds. We can, continuous integration builds. There are ways, and they're well documented, so I'm not gonna cover them, to get them into GitHub. So if you do any kind of builds off of GitHub, you can have it fail, uh, push your fails to GitHub. Individual ones are great, but you wanna see how we're going to do over time. So, web page test, oh, I forget this exact URL. Oh, sorry, web page, wptmonitor.org enables you to set it up so that your stats go over to the site so that you can see how they are over time. You can also run web, web page test. That's dependent, sorry. Sorry. That's dependent on um, the um, WP instance or um, the question the stats can yeah. be either or. The question is if this is dependent upon the web page test instance, if you're using the public or the private, did I get that correct? Yeah. Um, you can also download and install this, install this locally. So uh, if you do public, go to public. If you do private, you can do private. You can't go private to public. Um, so we can run this in the command line and from here we can do, we, we define our own tasks because in this particular case, when we're running it from the command line, we're not using the, um, we're not using the library and task name. So when we run this, we end up with pretty pictures that we need to have these running from the same place all the time because it stores all of these locally, which is a good start, but maybe we want something a little bit more chaotic like these. So in looking at these, I mean these, oh, these, these made me happy sort of thing when these first came out because I could see over time how my sites were performing or you know, particularly not performing. The problem with these tools is that they weren't integrated into Grunt, they were just command line tools. So, if you have tools that are currently existing that run on the command line or that you can trigger from the command line, Grunt Shell, there's also Grunt Exec, does a very similar thing, enables you to do commands that are outside of the Grunt ecosystem. You set it up so that you have a callback, you have a command and then you have a callback that does something with the output of that command and it enables you to pretty much open up anything that you have that currently exists, you can likely, and they're already automating, you can connect into the grunt world. Okay. Uh, so back to those, as an example using grunt shell, back to the, the, the images, that, the, the little bit more chaotic ones. Web page test mapper uh, is dependent on the web page test API, and this enables us to 
uh, when you install these, these need to be installed globally because these um, basically are like commands that you run on the command line. They aren't grunt command, they are just commands. They're programs that you run. Enables you to define what files you want to have loaded and when you have them loaded, uh, you can then run them and from there you get output and um, you can then take this output and then that output then goes into the pretty pictures. And, oh gosh, yes, we made a change. We measured the effects and we have these pretty pictures, but we need a better way to actually announce the effects that had. Uh, back to the beginning was it's everybody's problem, but if we don't know how the changes have affected everyone, if it's this thing that a developer has to run on his machine and it isn't priority, isn't built in, and isn't aware, then it's never gonna be everyone's problem and it needs to be. So, people really like pretty visualizations. They like the things up on the wall. They like to know that things are happening. Uh, the site that I highly recommend for the ease of use in order to generate a lot of these visualizations is sitespeed.io. In particular, if you go to run.sitespeed.io, just throw in a URL very similar to web page test. Uh, throw it in, you end up with um, a summary at the end that says, hey, here are the good things and here are the bad things. Very similar to the def perf that we had back in the beginning that was on the command line, but more instead of here, instead of the actionable items, here are the things that you, you need to be aware of that you need to start changing. Fixing, upgrading. Uh, fabulous part about this is that it provides uh, a list that you can go through. It's like here, well, look at this, sorry. Uh, here's the detailed summary. Here are all of the, the key performance metrics that you have. Uh, it also says, here are the most used assets. So if you know what the most, you can have it crawl your entire site if you wanted to do this. And uh, here are the most used pages on this. So we know that if, if someone is going to download this one asset, they're gonna have it cached. So you wanna make sure that you, it lists your caches. So you wanna make sure that there's a, a that this, this asset is not downloaded each time. It also lists, uh, oops, sorry, uh, the largest images. Uh, that one was important to me because I realized that I was not indeed using responsive images. I was building them, but I forgot to put in the sizes on those. And it also lists the worst loading, uh, the slowest assets. When I realized that one of my CSS files was taking 16 seconds to load, it's like, oh, wow, what is going on? And more importantly, do I need that CSS file? Because you know, clearly I'm working around on, the, on my website and I don't think I really need this file anymore. So, in order to automate this, you know, that's great, we can do the URL, you know, you, you could even script this, right? I mean, in theory, you could, you could do a web scraper, you could submit to this URL, and that's fine, but um, a lot of companies prefer to keep things in-house, and I can understand that, and so, one of the things that you can do, I'm gonna give you a moment to copy down this URL, okay, just kidding. Um, <laughs> One of the things that uh, Peter Hedenskog had talked about recently is how he had set up uh, SiteSpeed to run locally your own instances using Docker. And uh, I had difficulties following his, so I did the hard work for you and would like to go through real quick on setting up the Docker installs. Uh, I would like to point out that right now, if you have your laptops open and wanna go to tiny.run colon 3000, there happens to be a running install. Uh, but I won't give you the username and password to the end of this presentation. So, you install Docker. Uh, it's download clickable kind of sort of thing. It's, it's fairly simple, straightforward, even for Linux. And you do a pull of three Docker containers. These are the ones that he has, to, uh, two of the ones he controls, and one is Grafana for all of the pretty graphs. Uh, this, I wanted to say that you could do this whole setup in five minutes. In reality, pulling these down and installing these takes that five minutes. It actually took me 12, so it's gonna take a little longer. And if you're, on a high, if you're on a hotel network, it'll take half an hour. So you start Graphite, and because you're gonna download these slides, you're gonna be able to just cut and paste these uh, commands. So basically, you start the Grafana, sorry, the Graphite container. Then you start the Grafana container, and Here's, and when you, when you do this, you can then go and you can log in to your instance. Uh, in particular, if you paid any attention to this slide, which I hope you weren't, I hope you're paying attention to me, uh, you see that there is actually a, a username and password in there, and those happen to be the ones that are available on tiny.run. 
colon 3000 if you go to it. So my user, my super strong password, you log in and seed the system with a single metric run. So you have the data gathering and then you have the graphics generation with the graphite and the grafana and now you need to give it data. So if you seed it with a single metric run, you then have something to play with in order to build up your graphs. This is where most people get stuck because in the online documentation it says your Grafana host or your Graphite host and I'm just like, I have no idea what this is. It turns out that it's the Docker IP address. So if you do an if config and you look for Docker zero, that's the IP address that you wanna use. So you take that and uh, yeah, it's barely red there. Uh, you take that and that's your, your, when you run your metric run, you're gonna run yet another Docker run. You're gonna give it that IP address. You're gonna give it your URL. And then you're going to give it a namespace. And this namespace is where in the graphs this particular data is going to live. And you run it, and now, great. You log in, and this is what you get, and you're thinking, whew, that is a dark screen. It is a dark screen, it's all black. Uh, but if you go to data sources, this is where you'll set up your Graphite instance, and this test button you want to use. Oh my gosh, it is, it is a godsend sort of thing. Type everything in. In particular, the problems that I had with this were when you type in the URL, you need HTTP or HTTPS in front of it, which was a surprise to me. Um, and if you're using um, this, the Docker setup, you want to use a proxy. Uh, hit the test and you go ahead and save. And then go to the dashboards and the dashboards, it's not very clear how you set these up, but you download the, the well, drop down under the home button and then you click new and now you have the screen to do, uh, you add your dashboards. You add a graph and when you're adding a graph, oh, another hidden th thing, follow the arrows pretty much. There's, the, there's a place where you do edit, you click to edit and you get this new thing at which point you can start adding data. Okay, so you've done a single metric run and now you have the data available. So you add, a, you add the metric that you want to do and since you have seeded it, it will now follow the paths. Um, if you don't have it, if you don't have the data source working, then it won't provide the paths and it's very confusing to go through. So you go through and when you run it, you get a data point and this is fantastic. You run your metrics. The best way to continue to get these data points is to put it on a cron job. So uh, there, you can run your Docker gathering metrics call on a cron job and then you end up with very full graphs. You can also send over a ping so that when you do a production deploy, a marker gets set so that you see, okay, everything's going, oh, and there's production deploy and everything went up. Okay, let's look at what we did in that particular deploy to see what we did wrong. All right. As I said, this is currently available, I'm going to leave it live, likely to the end of the weekend, uh, and hope that it doesn't get stuck. Either I'm speaking fast or I have a question. Um, just a sec. Uh, also worth looking at are these particular tools. Um, download the slides and grab them really quick. All right, questions? Uh, there is an API call that you do. Um, that is in the documentation that I did not put this in here. Sorry, the question was how do I set the, the production <laughs> deploy markers? Uh, that is in the API. So. I have gone 42 minutes, and one of the things that uh, is kind of important to me is to make sure that you can leave with what you need to get this going. And a couple of people have said, well, what about the private instance? And if you have an API, uh, if you have an API key and you only get 200, uh, you end up, or you're waiting, you're always waiting behind these other ones. So waiting behind uh, web page tests, and it is popular, uh, it's kind of painful to me. So I'm a big fan of setting up my own server and they have made it easy to do and it's an Amazon install so I can go with questions or I can give you a four minute how to set this up. Four minutes? Questions. Four minutes it is, okay. So first thing you do is you log in to AWS Amazon and uh, you have to have an account. If you don't have an account, go ahead and sign up for that account and you go to the EC2 instance, upper left. You'll be able to follow these slides um, as you go along, download them, follow them. So click on the EC2 instance, and then launch instance. What you're gonna do is you're going to search 
or the community AMIs. The web page test people will set up all these AMIs. They've already set up all of this stuff. They've done all of the hardening of the stuff. Just grab them and upload them. Go back to the web page test documentation where they list. So uh, EC2 basically gives you different regions that you have to, uh, that things are available in. So you have to find the web page test AMI that's in that region. So we go back over to web page test in the documentation, it lists the region, the URL is at the top of the page. We cut and paste it. I happen to be in Oregon, so I knew which one to look for. So I paste that value in and I search for the correct web server. When I find it, I go ahead and use this particular AMI. And you'll note that this message is important. In particular, it deals with the security groups. It basically says what traffic can come in. By default, no traffic can come in. You're gonna have to edit that. So you click the button on the bottom, the launch, and another one comes up that basically these are your keys to get into your server. You need to remember to grab these keys. Uh, so follow the steps to get the keys. And once the keys are there, you're going to watch, to, watch this instance come up. Once the instance comes up, woohoo, instance is up, scroll down to the next step. That took me about 10 minutes to figure out the first time I did it. Scroll down, you click, the instance, and now you've got your list of instances. And this one, this one took me another 10 minutes. I think this one actually took me 20 minutes. Scroll down again. So now we have our security groups. Now we can set up what comes in to this particular instance. And in this instance, when you look at it, you're just gonna have uh, port 22. You can SSH in with the keys that you had previously downloaded. So go ahead and click that, the security ones. When you click the security ones, you can then add yeah, your inbound traffic. You want to ha allow 80 and 443. Uh, those are your HTTP and HTTPS. So those come in, go ahead and edit. These are the three that you want. And when you're done, you hit save and then, oh, sorry. These are the three that you want. I missed a step there. Oh, you add the rules. And these are the rules that you, you would want to add. All right, phew. Click on the instances over in the left side and now we know what we have. We have our URL. This, this URL is at this point live and accepting traffic. And we can go ahead and if we paste that into the URL, we have our own private instance. The problem is, is that it doesn't do anything. There are two parts to web page test. There's the front end where you get your results, and I am now over 45. And then you have the part that actually does all of the work. So we have to go through this process again and install the workers. We have the server, and now we're going to install the workers. Phew. Oh, before we're going to install the workers, we're actually going to harden our server a little bit. So there is a PEM file that you downloaded and when it said, here are your keys. This is your key and you want to make sure that you SSH in as Ubuntu. And I'm going to give you, if you are not a Unix person, have no fear. I'm going to give you the exact commands that you can do in VI because I don't like VI. I like Emacs. Who likes Emacs? Not enough of you. Okay. So you open up VI because VI is on every system. Emacs is not. And you delete the first line, which is basically allows them to get into your EC2 system. And then you save it. And then you, uh, using the same process, you add, you update a few more files. Uh, these are the files that you specifically want to do. Uh, contact me if you need help on doing these. I'm more than happy to help you on these. And then you set up your keys. This is basically where you are, your, your, your region. You need to specify the regions that you're in. And you add your key. You update the values to your key. This key is important because it's going to be used for the servers that are working. This is how the servers, or sorry, the, the, the workers can communicate to the, the main, main server and no one else can. Restart the web server and now we're going to set up the testing instances. And this is where there are ways to set up your EC2 server key in the settings.ini of your server. So your server will automatically start the working instances, which is fantastic and the easy way to do it. So I'm gonna go with the hard way to do it, just so that you have everything. So for the manual setup, once again, you go back, you launch an instance, you find the instance for the workers instead of the server. And this is the one that's the tricky part that bites a lot of people. You want to set up your configuration, your user data before you start the instance on the very first time. And this is where you put in your key. This is where you put in your server host. And this is, this is, this is the, what ties your, your workers to your server. Then once you save that, you launch your instance and you wait. Eh, a few more minutes. And so then after you're done with that, after basically your EC2 unit, your workers are starting up, they're communicating with the server, and then the server will say, gotcha. Now you have your private instance, and you can use this for all of your tests. These 
are also available, um, I believe, not just on AMIs, but also on Docker. So you can install it in-house. I know that there, are, there were some companies that had talked to me before that they, nothing goes out, nothing. So it is possible to install this also in-house using just web page test. Then when you run this, you can run the, all of these tests that we had before and we get our pretty graphs. All right, now, <laughs> now that I'm way over, questions? Did I talk too fast? You're giggling, I must have. All right, thank you.